What's up, everybody? Troy Cartwright here. Welcome back to another episode of Ten Year Town. We dropped part one of the Q and A episode last Thursday, and part two will be dropping this Thursday. So keep an eye out for that in your podcast feed. Thank you so much for all your great questions. If you've got your own to submit, you can do that at tenyeartown.com. Thanks. Today's guest is the legendary songwriter and publisher Chris Dubois. You know him from songs like You Should Probably Leave, recorded by Chris Stapleton, and Mud on the Tires, recorded by Brad Paisley. And he is a co-founder of the independent music publishing company, Seagale. This episode has so much in it that we actually had to break it into two parts. So you'll be getting part one today and part two next Tuesday. I'm so excited for you guys to listen to this episode. You're going to learn a ton. So without further ado, here he is, Chris Dubois. Well, I always start this thing off with the same question, which is, uh, how long have you been in town? <laughs> well, my story is a little different. I, I, I wasn't born here, but we moved here when I was six years old. Okay. Uh, you Did know, your, was it for parents' job or something like well, that? Well, it was, but it was so my father could pursue a career in songwriting. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we were, uh, we were in Oklahoma. I was... Uh, just a kid in Stillwater. I was born in Stillwater. My parents were uh, at Oklahoma State University, and they were living in married student housing. And uh, unless I'm wrong, my father was uh, going to school full-time and working full-time at the same time and wow. raising two kids. That's crazy. I know. It's insane to think about. But uh, he graduated. We moved down to Dallas. He worked for the Federal Reserve Bank down there, and then uh, he moved back to Stillwater to get his master's and was working on his Ph.D. He met Scott Hendricks and some of the guys that ended up uh, being in Russ's heart and was writing songs and started taking trips to Nashville. And uh, I'm not going to give his story <laughs> the justice that it deserves, but uh, but he got enough traction in Nashville that he decided to pack the family up and, and move to town. So I moved to town to – so my dad could chase his dream. Gotcha. So I we moved here when I was six, so I grew up here. And I guess you kind of grew up around the music business. I did. I mean, it was, I, I think of it like I think about my children growing up around the music business. It's not like they're with me down on Music Row every day. I don't, yeah. I don't bring my work home. We have five kids, uh, and I grew up with just an older sister. Um, so there wasn't nearly as much chaos in my house when I was growing up as there are as there is in my house now, but, yeah. um, but my dad used to bring his demos home and play them around the house. We had a, a reel to reel player in the living room. Awesome. Quarter inch. Yep. He used to bring his demos home and, and play them. And we had, you know, musicians, the, the ones that didn't have a uh, family in, in Nashville would come over for Thanksgiving and a lot of the rest of the art guys would come over and, uh, hang out and play songs around the living room and, so yeah, I grew up around it, and yeah. it, it wasn't really until I got into high school that I started listening to country music because at that point it was like my dad's music. So I was listening to anything but, and it was you know heavy metal, rock and roll, uh, rap, old school rap, like yeah. the old Sugar Hill records. Uh, the first concert I ever went to was Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers when I was in seventh grade. That's pretty good. Damn the Torpedoes tour. Wow. Uh, then I went to see 1984 tour for Van Halen. Eight minutes auditorium, and that was just kind of where I was at musically. Yeah, and then when I went to uh, high school, I had uh, a couple of new friends. I played football. They listened to country music. I just thought that was bizarre. And then when I s spent the night at their house, I'll never forget. We were, they had the radio on like we were falling asleep. I was laying there on the couch, and I heard like two songs my dad wrote, and I was like, "My dad wrote that. These guys are actually listening to it." And I, I knew the songs, and I knew, you know, other songs that were on country radio. And just almost overnight, I started listening to country radio. Yeah. And my dad would come home, and he's like, what are you listening to? It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to country music. His version of country music was a little more pop. It was the Restless Heart stuff, yeah. like I mentioned, and stuff that kind of was more reminiscent to the Eagles, which was what he listened to and was very heavily influenced by. Um, I was drawn more to the Hank Williams Jr., George Strait, more traditional yeah. kind of stuff. but. Uh, but I became a student pretty fast of, um, of songwriters and started identifying the writers that, 
that I loved. I could turn a George Strait album over and look at the credits on the back and see how many Dean Dillon songs were on there, and I'd know if it was going to be a good record by how many songs Dean had on there. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. And, uh, was a big fan of Bob McDill's. Uh, I knew McDill was a big influence on my dad. So I just started paying close attention to the songs that he wrote and and became a real passionate lover of country music. And uh, when I got into college, I had been cutting grass for the summer. So, you know, I went to Knoxville, went to University of Tennessee, came home for the summer. And I said, hey, instead of cutting grass, do you think there's anything I could do around Music Row? I yeah. was 18. And he picked up the phone and uh, called Bob Kirsch over at Polygram International Publishing. And I got a $5 an hour job making tape copies at Polygram. And, uh, and that was really eye-opening. It was my first opportunity to see what the music business really looked like from the publishing and writing perspective. And yeah. it was uh, Bob McDill was writing at Polygram at the time. I used to come in and hang out. And I get to see him bring his new demo session in on raw quarter inch tape and I would take uh, that quarter inch tape and and splice it to the end of his latest reel I mean their entire catalog was saved on quarter inch reel to reel and my job was to cut in the the new demo sessions and then make cassette copies of them to to pitch around town but I just I loved the energy in the room I used to stay after hours and make cassette copies of the songs I loved and and that's where I kind of fell in love with publishing yeah yeah wow so did you um I guess, did you fi like finish at Knoxville or? I did. And then I, did uh, you come straight back or? Well, I uh, I finished in Knoxville. I got a degree in accounting, which I only did that because it was kind of easy. Okay. You know, they didn't have a music business program and it was an SEC school. I mean, you know, it was, it was really learning more life skills than academic skills. Uh, yeah. Things to do and things not to do right. learning the hard way but I, I would come home in the summers and i would uh i did the polygram tape room job for two summers and uh knowing that i was studying accounting i thought i should give that a try so after my uh junior year of college i went and uh and took a summer job at flood bumstead mccrady and sales yeah. Uh, that's what they were called at the time but i just did uh, just accounting work there and i actually did that for two summers I stretched my college experience into four and a half years so I could get one more football season in in hopes that we might beat Alabama, which we did not while I was there. <laughs> but uh, by the time I got my degree in accounting, I knew that I didn't want to work in accounting. But, uh, you know, I'd officially graduated at that point. My father had officially turned the spigot off, so I needed a job. Yeah. And uh, so I came back to Nashville, and I got a job working at O'Neill Hageman. Uh, which was another accounting firm at the time. They were located right there on 16th. And uh, I did that. Before I did that, I actually took a couple of job interviews around Music Row for some creative positions. And I met with uh, Gary Overton when he was at B&A Records. Uh, and I met with Donna Hilly at Sony Tree. And Donna was so sweet. And she spent probably an hour with me and we just talked. And she told me she'd love to hire me, but she just didn't have anything. And at the end of the day, there just wasn't a job at the time. So that's when yeah. I took the job at Enel Hagman. But after being there about nine months, I'd, I'd had enough. And I called my dad and I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, I'm going to quit. And uh, I'll wait tables, which I'd done in college. Um, and he said, uh, he said, hold on, don't quit yet. He said, I've heard that you might be in contention for a membership job at ASCAP, which I didn't even know what he was talking about. Mm. But Donna Hilly at Sony Tree, who I'd, met with and who was so sweet was good friends with Connie Bradley who was running the ASCAP Nashville office and uh, Larry Willoughby uh, had just left ASCAP to take a job uh, in the record business and they were looking for a young membership rep so out of the blue Connie called me and offered me a job of membership so I would have taken that job for five dollars an hour if I had to. yeah but I uh, actually uh, got a decent salary and got an opportunity to, to work at ASCAP. And I had no idea what I was getting into. I knew the very basics about what ASCAP was uh, just from talking to my dad and asking questions about how he, how he was getting paid as a songwriter. But, you know, in a nutshell, my job was to educate, meet with young writers and educate them about 
performance rights, how they worked, why they needed to affiliate with ASCAP, and to listen to their songs and critique them. Yeah. And uh, most of the writers that come through the doors at ASCAP are looking for opportunities to meet with publishers. Right. Um, so that's what I did. And I felt very in over my head the first month or two that I was there. I just sat in on meetings uh, with other membership reps and watched them critique songs and I kind of identified the critique methods that I thought were good and the ones that I thought weren't so good. And, and then they just kind of threw me in and I started meeting with writers and they started playing me songs and, and I would just tell them what I thought. Now at that point, you know, I had grown up around it. I was a student of country music and I'd written a little bit, but it, it was never something that was a priority for me. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to be my, my long-term goal. And I was just kind of sitting there critiquing songs. And there was a, a young Belmont intern that started around the time I got hired named Brad Paisley. And he started coming in and hanging out in my office because we we're very close in age and because I was by far the youngest rep there. Yeah. And uh, so Brad and I became fast friends. He was really the, the first guy my age that knew as much about country music as I did. So we bonded over that. And uh, and his writers that he loved and the writers I loved, we'd, we'd swap songs and had no idea he was a musician or a singer or a songwriter uh, until one day he came in carrying a guitar case and I was like I didn't know you played do you write and he's like yeah I said why didn't you say anything he said well I just didn't want to overstep my bounds yeah I said well play me something so he so he did he played me a couple of things and I was in the mode of giving feedback at that point yeah so as soon as he played it for me it was the the first song he played for me I think was called before I heard your name not a great song but there were some great lines in it yeah and there was one line that made the hair of my arm stand up and I, I could tell right away this guy's different yeah but as soon as he played it for me i just my first reaction was to just give him feedback on his songs about the good versus what i felt like he could do better and and a lot of times when i would give feedback to writers sitting at ascap i could see their countenance fall it's all like they were hearing rejection mm. and brad was not like that at all he he picked his guitar up immediately and started changing it and then he played me something else and kind of more feedback and from that point forward, he would just come into my office every day and say, hey, what do you think about this? And he'd play me something. Yeah. And that led to he and I writing songs. And uh, so I got very spooled very quick. My first co-writer was Brad Paisley. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So we did that. I was still entrenched at ASCAP. It was a the kind of job where I met with writers every hour on the hour all day long and would go to showcases at night. And I was single, didn't have a girlfriend. I was, you know able to go over to Brad's at 10 o'clock and write until three o'clock in the morning and then yeah. go home and then wake up and do it again. And, uh, so we did that for about, did that for about two or three years. And then he signed a, his first publishing deal with EMI and, uh, ultimately went on to, to sign with Arista records and cut his first record. And around that time, you know, his deal at EMI was starting to come up. I was still working at ASCAP and we just started, just brainstorming about how cool it would be to have a publishing company. Wow. So 27 years old, no idea what we were doing and dumb enough to think I was smart enough to do it. Uh, and thankfully at that, uh, because it ended up working out great. But in 1999, uh, he and I and his producer, Frank Rogers, uh, started Seagill as a joint venture with EMI. Wow. Yeah. Were you, so at this point, were you, writing there as well like were you what was no. what was it what were they thinking that your role was going to be well at that point i was still i was kind of the business-minded guy okay. frank frank was uh he was signed to emi as a writer he was also signed there as a producer brad was signed there as a writer and uh both of their publishing deals were coming up around the same time so yeah. the timing was good i had never signed a publishing deal when when i was working at ascap I was able to keep all my publishing. So when Brad went in and cut his first record, uh, there were six songs, I think, on that first record that we had written that I owned the publishing on. And uh, so when we approached EMI about doing a co-venture, I was bringing my publisher in, my publishing in, I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, and then, you know, we just kind of put all of our songs in a big pile and just split the publishing down the, EMI, down the middle and EMI owned half and we owned half. Wow. 
And uh, my job at that point, it, there were no employees. It was just Frank would continue to do what he was doing uh, as a producer, writer. And Brad was the writer artist and I was the writer business guy. Dang. And uh, we signed two writers that first year. We signed Trent Wilman was the first writer that we signed and another gentleman named Tim Owens who came through the door with a, with a Diamond Rio cut. And uh, so we, we knew that if Brad took off as an artist, that would give us a, a huge boost. Yeah. Uh, we were just passionate about what we were doing and felt confident that even if Brad didn't take off, we'd find a way to make it work. But Brad took off, so that made it a whole lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it worked. It did. For sure. I'm very familiar with your writing game. Right. I didn't realize you were such a, a great uh, businessman as well. So, Well, I mean, it, the days that I suck as a writer, I'm a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> the day that I suck as a businessman, what do you expect? I'm a writer, yeah. you know? There you go. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so talk to me a little bit about building, I guess Seagulls kind of had like several different iterations when i moved to town i guess this was i started coming up here in like 2015 um and all my i feel like all my favorite writers were at seagale and a lot of my friends sure were there and it just i don't know it had such a cool culture and well that was um, always uh very important to us and uh i was able to see what a publishing culture could be thankfully while I was working at polygram in the tape room. Yeah. The, it was a great culture there. How the writers and the pluggers just kind of, you know, would hang out and brainstorm about song pitches and play songs and you could just feel the passion in the room. Um, so yeah, the culture I think was a, an extension of the fact that it was a company owned by songwriters. Yeah. And, uh, there's been a lot of really successful, uh, songwriters that have started publishing companies since we started Seagale 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, but at the time, it was still a relatively novel concept. Uh, there were other companies. I know Little Big Town uh, wasn't just a, a band on country radio. It was actually a publishing company at one point. Okay. That was owned by Bob DePiro and Woody Bonar and Carrie O'Neill, and they were a very successful independent company. Yeah. But Bob was one of the business cogs in that wheel. And, um, and there was another company at the time called Patrick Joseph Music, and that was Pat Higdon. And uh, they had a great independent culture, and I was very enamored with what they were doing. Yeah. And uh, I just felt like we could do that. And uh, and so, and it really, it does boil down to, you know, what kind of writers are you signing? We signed two writers that first year. I think we signed two writers the next year. The next two writers we signed were Don Sampson, who, who wrote Midnight Montgomery for Alan Jackson. Yeah. And uh, Rebecca Lynn for Brian White, uh, along with other just great songs. He was a master craftsman. And Jay Knowles was the, the fourth writer that we signed. And he actually had written for Little Big Town uh, previously. And then uh, so we were just building this roster of writers. And yeah. uh, we signed another writer shortly thereafter uh, named Jim Brown, who everybody calls Moose. He's a phenomenal session piano player. Um but Don Sampson, for example, uh, you know, started having cuts and success pretty quickly. Uh, Moose's first cut that he got was "It's Five O'clock Somewhere" for Alan Jackson. Yeah. Um, and then around that same time, we also signed Chris Stapleton to his first publishing deal. And a big part of our culture at that time had to do with the very first employee that we hired, whose name was Lizzo Sullivan, is Lizzo Sullivan, and uh, and she just had that passionate personality she's got a hilarious sense of humor and was just a big part of that culture and she's the one that that told me and frank that we just needed to hear this chris stapleton guy so yeah. uh, so we got down um, in her office and listened to him play and were able to sign him to his first publishing deal and you know and really it was the writers chemistry amongst themselves that created the culture that it was yeah. And thankfully, you know, we were able to write with them too, in addition to just being their publisher. So it's a very unique scenario. Um, but, you know, the first 10 years uh, of our existence, we were a co venture with EMI, and we had some really big, successful years. A lot of that had to do with Brad and his success as an artist. But, you know, Chris Stapleton started having big hits as a writer. I was fortunate to get on a good run as a writer and have some hits outside of Brad. Yeah. Um, 
And of course we had big copyrights like uh, it's five o'clock somewhere. But when we got to that 10 year point, we knew we were in a financial position to go independent. So we broke away from EMI and, uh, and became a, a standalone independent. And that was in 2009. And then in 2010, we won ASCAP publisher of the year yeah. and then won it again in 2011. And according to ASCAP at the time, we were slated to win it a third year in a row. And then Sony and uh, EMI merged. Gotcha. We couldn't overcome that one. Yeah. But uh, I would say, you know, I was very fortunate to win ASCAP Writer of the Year around that time. But when we won Publisher of the Year, I mean, that's still probably what I'm the most proud of. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Did, um, what are some of your, I mean, you've had quite a few hits. Is there, I don't know, one that sticks out to you or is extra special to you? Um, well, I mean, Who Needs Pictures was my very first single, radio single. It was Brad's first radio single. Yeah. And the first time I heard that on the radio, it just, on that, nothing will ever replace that. Yeah. And that was uh, such a huge emotional moment for me. I'm still proud of that song, even after all these years, even though it, it makes references to getting film and a camera developed that my kids don't fully understand. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do love that song. Um, you know, Brad is such a, a, a good friend of mine and a huge part of my career. And, you know, not only Who Needs Pictures, but probably Mud on the Tires. Yeah. I saw him do that last week at a show. And uh, just hearing everybody sing along, it's just, that's one that I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, those are probably the two that come to mind quickly. But, you know, I mean, you should probably leave, you know, with that being pro the most recent hit I've had. I hear that now, and it, even though we wrote that like 12 years ago, I just i am very proud of that one too. Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing song. Thank you. Um, well, I guess what kind of – I mean, you're kind of in this unique position to answer some of these, these questions I have because this – my primary purpose for this podcast is to just give something for people that are just getting started on their journey to kind of, um, I don't know, understand that everybody's path is different. Um, but what kind of things you talk about, like building this, the songwriter culture at Seagale, what kind of things, I don't know, kind of grab your attention as a publisher that makes you want to work with a writer? Well, it's always going to be the songs, first and foremost. That seems like a cop-out answer. But in terms of what I look for stylistically in songs, it's that indescribable thing that just makes me go, yes. You know, <laughs> I, I used this as an example the other day. I said, what well, we were writing, I said, man, we need a moldy box of vanilla wafers in the first verse. It's just not interesting enough. <laughs> and that's a reference to uh, L.A. Freeway by Guy Clark. I, I you know. That's the kind of furniture that he would put in his songs. Um, and I, the writers that are that descriptive and, and, you know, have good commercial instincts along with the artistic ability to paint a picture. I mean, some writers just have a unique gift, and those are the writers that we're looking for. I yeah. know that sounds like a big, broad answer, but but it, but it's also more than that. It's a you know, we're managing personalities too as a publishing company. Yeah. So if, if somebody walks through the door and is a brilliant writer, but is difficult to work with and becomes difficult to schedule rights with, you know, that can be a huge challenge. So if, if a writer comes in with just great creative instincts, but also just a good spirit and a good energy in the room, uh, that makes them very appealing to a publisher yeah. because you know that they're going to be easy to schedule rights with. Um, you know, that's that's it i mean you know nowadays you know people ask all the time if we're more uh drawn to artist writers or just pure songwriters mm -hmm. when we're signing uh, artists slash writers um and the answer is you know it, it just depends on the writer I th i'm looking for a unique gift whether it's uh someone that's a pure songwriter or it's somebody that has artist aspirations um but if they do have artist aspirations i mean that the personality aspect of it becomes even more important. Yeah. Their willingness to put the time in that it's going to take on social media 
and you know just being diligent about posting and things like that as silly as it sounds i mean 25 years ago that didn't even exist right um but yeah work ethic uh, you know that's the other one and you don't know someone's work ethic when you first meet them but you know what how they proceed after you expe- express interest to them i think is uh is important to uh just show what way well i mean i'll go back to like ascap that's when i first started realizing it when i would meet with songwriters at ascap and i would give them things that i wanted them to work on and then they'd call me three months later and they'd come back in for another meeting and they'd play me the same three songs that they played me three months ago it's like what have you been doing they're yeah. just still wanting publisher meetings now that's a totally different scenario from the writers that we're looking at as a yeah. publisher but i always tell the writers you know i teach a, a lyric writing class at belmont and they ask you know how do you keep a, a door open at a publishing company really it's about the songs i mean if if you've met with a publisher and they've expressed interest but they're not ready to put a deal on the table the best thing you can do is reach back out to them with a song that you're really excited about and you can't wait for them to hear because yeah. that is what's going to close the deal. It's the new music that they're writing. I, if they call me and say, I wrote a song I'm super excited about yesterday, can I send it to you? The answer is always going to be yes. Yeah. So, you know, just seeing the diligence and the continued uh, drive that they have as a songwriter is a big part of it. Yeah, that's amazing advice. That's some of the most I don't know, probably useful advice that someone's actually given on this podcast. Well, and I, I see it. I, I've seen it with writers that, you know, we've we've met with, we like them, we may have connected them with some of our writers in our company, but you know, we it's a huge commitment to sign a writer. Yeah. So when, you know, when we express that interest, but the writer just calls to see if you're ready to sign them and that's the reason they're calling. I mean, the answer's gonna be no. Yeah, but if they call with new music, then yes, I've got thirty minutes tomorrow. Come by and play me some of your new music. Yeah, or it could be yeah, I I don't have time, but send it to me. I'd love to hear it. I mean, once you've got the door open, the way you keep that door open is by sending great music. Yeah. The way that deal gets closed eventually with that publisher is going to be what you're writing, what you wrote yesterday. Yeah, and not being afraid to hear feedback about. So I, I guess sometimes. You know, I don't, you learn as you go, but it can be the first time you turn in a song or send a song to a publisher and they're like, you know, this could be better or, or, or may have you considered changing this and that that can be hard information to process at the Absolutely. Beginning. It can, but you know, you kind of have to just have to develop. The you got to learn at some point along the way that. You know, it's what everybody else's opinion is that really matters the most because mm. uh, that's what you're going on. I mean, you're not going to be a successful songwriter if you don't care what other people think. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's, that's what's going to make money is going to them going to play your songs over and over again. So, yeah, you've got to open up to, to criticism. Yeah. All right, everybody. That was part one of the Chris Dubois episode. Part two is going to drop next Tuesday. Thank you so much for listening. Please rate and review this podcast on Apple Music. Sorry, Apple Podcasts on YouTube. It helps us out so much. We'll see you Thursday for the Q&A episode and then next Tuesday with part two of this episode. Thank you guys so much. Love you.